In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, in the Middle Ages, there was a movement in Europe known as the Rosary of Churches. They were trying to build churches, especially in honor of Our Lady. That was their special in, in this year. And it is said, cities, small towns, and even villages vied with one another to rear cathedrals of Mary. So it was like a competition. Each town, each little city, each little even village trying to build more than, better than what the others did. And so there was a holy rivalry competition. Many of these churches have fallen into oblivion. When it started from the very early times, and so this, in course of time, many of these churches fell into oblivion, they were forgotten. Some still stand, and all their untouched glory, treasure houses of ancient masterpieces of art, sculpture, glasswork, and architecture. So it was something like a treasure house of the art. Every church was filled with, or they were trying to fill as much as they could, the church with pieces of art. Their erection was entirely voluntary, a labor of love. That is, those who were wealthy, those who had riches, they contributed their wealth profusely. And those who were poor, they were willing to give their labor freely for the building of, of these churches. And that is how, the, how, thus with the contribution of both the rich and the poor alike, the churches grew up. The oldest of these is Our Lady's Cathedral in Chartres. It is this church, this cathedral, in honor of Our Lady, that stands as a, stands out above all the all the others. The old, oldest of these is Our Lady's Cathedral at Chartres. Even before apostles arrived, there was a Catholic, a Celtic shrine at Chartres, dedicated to the Virgin who would bear a great king. So this is a strange thing. Even before the coming of the church over there, before the coming of the apostles to preach the church, there was already a temple dedicated to a virgin who would give birth to a great king. That is, a virgin who would give birth. Surely that was a good background for preaching about Our Lady. A church was built over this pagan shrine and in the church was enshrined the tunic which the Blessed Virgin Mary was said to have worn while on earth the gift of the Emperor Constantine. So this Constantine, Emperor Constantine who was the first emperor to be converted into Christianity and who accepted Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. So he gave a donation of this special tunic which he had obtained and which he generously contributed to this cathedral of Our Lady. So thus the church became very famous. It was at Chartres too that St. Bernard pleaded in 1148 the Crusaders to rescue the Holy Land. Saint Bernard, you know, the great devotee of Our Lady. And this Saint Bernard preached crusader or encouraged people to uh, go for crusades to rescue the Holy Land from the hands of the enemies. The cathedral was destroyed by many times. But in the 11th century, the real and lasting church was built 
with the forest of columns and a treasury of art, jewels and glass. It was said to be a forest of columns. So, so many were the number of the columns that was holding up the church. And they had the treasury of art, jewels and glass. It remains a most, it remains a must on the list of every pilgrim traveling to Europe. So those who go to travel Europe on this ch ch churches, this church, this cathedral is included as a must in the list of the their destinations to attend. A medieval bishop named Fulbert chose to build his city's cathedral of Our Lady on top of the highest hill for miles around. So his ambition was to build a cathedral that should be the tallest and that should be on the top of the tallest mountain in all around. But he didn't have much luck and three times his cathedral burned down. One of these, his successors, started to build the cathedral in 1250. So that means so many centuries later. Still that ambition was there, that the, the cathedral must be built, it should be tallest and should be on the top of the tallest mountain. And so this king started in 1250. When it was entirely completed in dressed stone, they were so proud of their achievements that they even said, it needed to fear nothing from the world's fire until judgment day. So sure they were that this church is going to last till the last judgment day and no earthly fire will destroy this cathedral, that was their great uh, pride and their great belief. It is the most important of the 80 cathedrals and nearly 500 cathedral size churches. The French people, with the single mindedness unparalleled in church history, built in that fantastically artistic century 1170 to 1270. So there is the span of years, 100 years, that is from 1170 to 1270. That 100 years is called the fantastic year, century, during which they, the French people especially built their churches and the most beautiful churches that to these pres uh, to these persons, priests and poets in stone, in cathedral. The cathedral was the house of God, the Bible in picture in, and image and a canticle of praise. So this was the importance they attached to the church they were building. For them, for the persons, for the priests, for the poets in stone, their cathedral was the house of God. Something that which we should be able to say about each, every church that we will, it is the house of God. Was the house of God, the Bible in picture and images. That is something like the church is actually an open Bible, where through the pictures and images, the whole Bible is open to us, or the Christian life is open to us. Then it is, an, it is a canticle of praise. It is there that we praise God, we gather together to worship God. So the church itself is to be considered as a great canticle of praise. The cathedral of Chartres stands out in unequaled significance spilling in delicately carved detail and magnificently balanced volumes that the Christian faith meant to 12 centuries of Europeans. 
So the 12 years of the Christian life was all summarized or brought into uh, pictures and images when they built the cathedral. Shard contains the most famous stained glass window in the world. That is again another beautiful thing can be said about this. The most beautiful stained windows as found in that particular cathedral. Its predominant, unique, remarkable blue has defied the skill to describe of writers everywhere. Any skilled writer will not be able to describe the beauty of the stained glass and the beauty that was added to the cathedral by the presence of the stained glass was so much beyond their explanation, their imagination. The sacred fears come alive in the glass and the whole nave of the church is suffused with sifted light. So when the stained glass is set there on the walls, the light enter into the uh, house, into the church, stained through or sifted through these glasses. So, all the colors that are there on the, sta on the stained glass will be reflected and will be previously poured into the church. Thus, the whole church becomes so beautiful, so wonderful to look at. Everything seen after this is an anti-climax. That is again another great uh, tribute at, given to this cathedral. He says, the cathedral, after seeing this cathedral, its beauty, its wonder, it is something like the climax. And then looking at other cathedrals or other churches is something like going down to the anticlimax. So thus, the church is so much praised. Everything seen after this is an anticlimax. Just as the Mother of God, to whom this other world art is dedicated, is the epitome of virginity, motherhood and womanhood, as all others of her sex pale into oblivion in the glorious light of her sanctity. So Mary is so, beauty, so beautiful, so holy, and when we contemplate Mary's beauty and Mary's, Mary's sanctity, all the other women, they fall into oblivion because she far uh, uh, surpasses all the others in beauty and sanctity. This cathedral has a majesty and a magic about it that can still evoke memories of past unity and stir the imagination of an even larger vision. So, American and African as well as European pilgrims can say our structures and sometimes feel that it is really theirs, just as the mother of God is the mother of all mankind. So it is not only of the Europeans, all the other nations can claim this cathedral as their own, because the cathedral which honors Mary is of uh, is, is universal. Everyone can meaningfully, rightly say, Mary is my mother. And so also, this cathedral, which is made in honor of her, can be called the cathedral of, of everyone belonging to any nation. So this cathedral shows the great majesty, the great beauty, the great holy, the holiness of Mary. And we can take pride as daughters of Mary, as children of Mary. Let us thank God for this great achievement of our uh, people uh, in building this church, building this cathedral. And let us more and more raise our hearts and minds to Mary, who is represented by the cathedral so beautifully built. Let us ask the grace and blessing of Our Lady that we may merit to raise our hearts and minds to heaven when we 
find such beautiful manifestations of their devotion to the Divine Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.